Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you like, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash CanadaEHX. You can also donate to the podcast by going to CanadaEHX.com and clicking donate, or you can go to buy me a cup of coffee slash Craig U. All of these links are also in my show notes. And for people who donate, I have various levels of benefits. For $5, you get a thank you at the start of the next episode of Canadian History X, Canada's Great War, and from John to Justin, and on social media. For $10, you get everything from the $5, plus this episode is sponsored by, with your name at the start. Also, I'll state it's sponsored by you on social media. For $20, everything from the $5 and $10, plus a second episode sponsored by you, and promotion of something you're working on. And for $50, everything from the $5, $10, and $20 plus, you get to choose a topic for me to cover on Canadian History X. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D. And I'm on Instagram and TikTok where I put up daily videos about Canada's history. Just go to my username, Bairdo37. And you can find weekly videos on Canada's history on my YouTube channel. Just go to youtube.com slash c slash Canadian History X. If you want to find transcripts of every episode I've ever done, you can go to my website, CanadaEHX.com. And there's over 700 posts on Canada's history there. This episode was a bit short, since White Star is a very small community. But there are no small histories, and I wanted to make sure every community in Canada gets featured, or at least a lot of them. For this episode, though, I expanded out from White Star a bit to hit some of the other communities in the area, including Paddockwood, Red Wing, and Spruce Home. The land that the area of White Star sits on now was once the home of the Cree people. The land was right in the middle of their territory that stretched from Hudson Bay all the way into northern Alberta. The area was the upper reaches of where the bison would migrate, giving the Cree many resources in the summer as the bison arrived before beginning their journey to the south. Throughout the area, artifacts have been found that date back at least 11,000 years. Today, White Star and its area sits on Treaty 6 land. In the early 1900s, Fred Pitt came to Canada looking for good lumber land, and that would result in him settling in the area of current Paddockwood. It was there that he built a log cabin for his home and set up a post office. Throughout the early years of the area, he would be found on horseback delivering letters and parcels to the residents of the area. He would also give the area the name Paddockwood, which was a village in England that he lived at before coming to Canada. One fascinating aspect of Paddockwood is that it's the location of the first Red Cross hospital in the British Empire, which was set up just after the First World War ended. In 1920, the Regina Leader Post reported, quote, It is now only a matter of a few weeks until the Paddockwood Red Cross outpost, the first of its kind, will be a concrete fact. This is a pioneer scheme of great interest in the country. At a recent meeting of the Provincial Red Cross Executive, It was stated that there would be other outposts started in the new districts, but they are waiting to see Paddockwood as a success. Judging by enthusiasm, it will be a very short time until the scheme may become general. In 1912, Red Wing began to come into existence thanks to the formation of the Red Wing School District, which was formed that year. From that, this tiny community began to spring up, which continues to be home to families who have lived in the area for generations. The name itself comes from the name of various chiefs of the local indigenous who now live at the Wapaton Dakota Nation Reserve. These chiefs, as a sign of their leadership division, wore a swan's feather dyed in red. The origin of White Star to the north of Prince Albert is thanks to the railroad, as with many places in the northern reaches of the Prairie Provinces. The White Star Post Office would eventually open on July 1, 1914, and would remain open for 50 years before it closed. In the 1920s, north of White Star at Christopher Lake, the Kennesaw Lutheran Bible Camp Log House would be built. No firm date is given for its construction, so it's possible it was built in the early 1930s. This building, which is built in the rustic log style, 
was originally built by the local mink breeder and farmer who owned the property. The building would become a distinctive part of the Bible camp when the camp was established in 1940. The building was first the girls' dormitory, then the administration building, before finally becoming a meeting room and staff lounge. Generations of young people have come to know the building well, and due to its heritage, it was made a municipal heritage property in 1999. On March 24, 1927, to the north of White Star, the Prince Albert National Park would officially open. Prime Minister William Lyne Mackenzie King would officially open the park himself on August 10, 1928. King would write about it in his diary, stating, quote, We had lunch under canvas midway at the entrance to the park. It was about 2.30 when we reached Wakasel Lake, a beautiful sheet of water with but one island, which has been named King Island. End quote. The park covers an area of 3,874 square kilometers and it is the only national park in Saskatchewan until the 1980s when Grasslands National Park was established. Upon the creation of the park, the local indigenous were removed by the RCMP with many of their cabins and possessions destroyed in the process. One of the park's most famous residents was Grey Owl, who was hired as the first naturalist for the park. It was in the park he would live, where he wrote several books on wilderness protection. Grey Owl, of course, was an Englishman who pretended to be indigenous, a fact that was not revealed until after his death. Within the park, there is Grey Owl's cabin and the graves of Grey Owl and his wife. I'd like to take a break away from the episode for a second to talk about ExploreNet. I spent most of my life living in rural areas in Canada, and I remember the days of dial-up internet and spotty high-speed service. For the past three years, I have been a customer of ExploreNet and I can honestly say that it is the best rural internet I have ever had. My job as a podcaster means I spend a lot of time researching online, interviewing people over Zoom, and uploading content. Through it all, ExploreNet has provided me with excellent service. When I'm not working, I enjoy streaming content on several streaming platforms and even doing some online gaming with a friend in Ontario. ExploreNet allows me to do all of that with ease. Right now, they offer up to 50 megabits per second on their new LTE network with unlimited data. Their service has only become faster and better since I first signed on. Today and beyond, ExploreNet is investing in building and upgrading the network at a rapid pace. ExploreNet is rural, and that is their route, and that is their focus. For more information about rural internet options in your area, go to ExploreNet.com or call 1-866-285-2253. In 1923, Paddockwood got the short end of the stick when it came to the Canadian National Branch Lines. A projected line was proposed to the community, and the grade was already laid down for it, but the Canadian Senate blocked the construction of the line and other branch lines. For Paddockwood, this was bad news as several soldiers had settled in the area, using help provided by the federal government. These individuals then stated they would be leaving the district as a railroad did not seem to be coming. At the time, there were between 200 and 300 soldier settlers in the district, who now felt stranded due to the decision by the Senate. A lot of land had already been cleared too, resulting in a lot of waste time and money for these men. In 1935, the Paddock Wood Community Hall was built. This long, rectangular building would become the social center of the community. Built through donated community labor, the head carpenters in its construction were Jack White and Axel Goplin. Through the years, the hall held many important events within the community. In the 1950s, a hardwood dance floor and kitchen was added to it, and in 1951, it was connected to electricity, allowing for weekly movies. And due to its historic link to the community, the hall was made a municipal heritage resource in 2008. The same year that Paddockwood Community Hall was built, the Pine Valley School was also constructed. In 1933, residents began to petition the district for the construction of a school due to the difficulty in getting their children to schools located elsewhere because of the muskeg, thick bush, and dangerous wildlife in the area. In 1934, the Pine Valley School Division was formed and construction soon began on the new school. The school would become an important part of the community life of the area and it would stay open as a school until 1948. The school was then used as the community centre until the 1950s where boxing and local theatre were held. In 1986, it was made a municipal heritage property. 
Throughout the Second World War, Paddockwood was noted for its support of the war effort. In fact, it had a district quota in November 1945 of $32,000, but it exceeded that by selling $54,000 for the war effort. As a result, it was given three lone pennants that it could fly to show others how supportive the community was for helping. And even though the war was over by this point, there was still the need to raise money, and Paddockwood certainly did that. Also in 1945, Prime Minister William Lyne Mackenzie King came to the area to campaign in the federal election. He would spend six hours touring throughout the area in Paddockwood and other places. He would stop at various community halls, schools, and farmyards. King, who would become the longest-serving Prime Minister in Canadian history, had represented the riding for some time. Even so, he was not always well-received during his tour of the area. One man named Sandy Edmonds, who was 77, was asked by King how he was. Sandy responded, quote, I am Scotch, what are you? End quote. King responded with, I am Scotch with every fiber. End quote. In Paddockwood, 81 school children were lined up on the road where they could wave to King who stopped by and spoke with them. Relating to schooling, in 1951, Elder Enns, the local teacher at White Star, disciplined a student for making too many mistakes in spelling by giving him the strap. In response, the boy's father punched Enns in the face. In response to that, the boy's father was charged with assault and had to pay a fine of $10 or spend seven days in jail. The judge in the case stated there was no justification for the assault, and this really shows how times have changed. On July 31, 1958, Spruce Home received a very famous visitor when Princess Margaret herself came to the community and visited the farm of Peter Scotham. She took part in the tour of the livestock buildings and had tea with the family in their log and stucco home where the family were living with seven of their ten children. She had come to the farm via helicopter for an informal visit. She would ask questions about the grade of wheat, posed for pictures, and spoke at length with the family. She wasn't the only famous person at the farm that day either. She was joined by Lieutenant Governor Frank Bastetto, Saskatchewan Premier L. F. McIntosh, and Prime Minister John Diefenbaker and his wife Olive. There was also a press corps of 40 people and several officials, as well as family and friends of the Scotham family. Peter Scotham would say, quote, She asked quite a few intelligent questions, I thought, for a princess, about the animals. She seemed to know quite a bit about what she was talking about. End quote. His wife would say, quote, I asked about the Queen's children, and she said Charles is about this big, motioning with her hand. I told her the house was of log construction, and she was quite interested in that. She said she would have liked to have seen the rest of the house, but by the time she thought of that, we were sitting down and tea was being served. There just wasn't enough time. End quote. The farm was chosen for the visit because of its background, as well as the fact that it typified a successful and diverse Saskatchewan farm. For Diefenbaker, it also had a special location because of the abandoned wooden hall across the road. He made his first ever political speech decades previous. In 1964, Paddockwood was dealing with a rash of robberies at the local credit union. Over the past two years, the bank had been hit three different times. The last robbery in June 1964 resulted in the loss of $1,300 in cash and checks. Two years previous, $1,600 was stolen, and in another instance, the robbers got away with no money. As a result of the robberies, the credit union decided the time was right to spend $8,000 to get a new vault installed to protect the money of local residents. I hope you enjoyed that episode of my look at White Star Saskatchewan. If you did, please leave a rating and review. If you like, you can email me at craig at canadaehx.com. You can find me on Twitter. My handle is Craig Baird, C-R-A-I-G-B-A-I-R-D, and I'm on Instagram at Bairdo37. As well, again, if you want to support the podcast, you can for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada E-H-X. And you can donate to the podcast by going to Canada E-H-X.com and clicking donate. I'd also like to thank all of my wonderful patrons, and I apologize if I get any names incorrect. Wendy Mills, Keelan Pregnitz, Michael Matthews, Joanna Parker, Jeff Dahl, Vobbs, Robert Page, Richard D., Colin Johnson, Jeff Hershey, Kyle Murray, Steve Pakin, Matthew Gartho, Lionel Romaine, Dr. Bob Turner, Randy Hayden, Doug Campbell, Reg W., Deborah Carlson, Francis Helbling, Nick Zinri, 
Shannon Marshall, Clinton Martinez, Dimitri Shove, Aaron O'Hara Myers, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke Guess, JP Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.